Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to say welcome. Um, we're going to talk today about how to become a contributor to Microsoft Docs. So for today's agenda, we're going to go through, um, we're going to introduce DevRel to you and, and what that is. We're going to be covering some tips and tricks in Microsoft Docs that you might not be aware of. And most importantly, we're going to cover how to contribute to Microsoft's open source Docs as code in GitHub. We'll cover what you need to know. Um, one of the first things you need to know is that you need a github.com account to contribute. And if you already have one, you're all set. Um, throughout the presentation, um, I, like we just talked about, come off um, mute if you want to ask a question and we'll um, you know, answer questions as we go. Okay, introductions, I think, um, we pretty much already got introduced personally, but William and I are on the SQL Docs team. Um, we're internally uh, known as Rogue One. When we're not violating copyright laws with that nickname, we support tens of thousands of articles about SQL Server. We work with the product groups and the program managers for everything SQL Server. So this includes all of the various flavors of Azure, um, as well as Azure Snaps Analytics and, and the technologies under that umbrella. We also cover content for data platforming tools like SQL Server Management Studio and Azure Data Studio. Um, we're just one content team, uh, and today we're going to be talking about all of Microsoft Docs for all technologies. So there are a, you know, there's a, a number of content teams. Um, we're just, a, for the number of documents, we're actually a very small team. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to William for the next section. William? Yeah. Can we go ahead and take control then? Well, did you want to do this slide? Did oh, actually, this was yeah. me. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the mission statement. Um, so this is our mission statement. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I, I just want to tell you in short that we basically have two missions. One, we want to enable students, job seekers, and workers online with great content. And um, two, we want to build an active community of contributors to ensure we offer the breadth and depth of content to these audiences. The second goal is why we're doing this presentation. We want to communicate um, specifically with you how you can be part of my, the Microsoft Docs experience. Microsoft Docs is not Wikipedia. It's not open to all edits. But we do have hundreds of thousands of articles, and we want to embrace the wisdom of you, our technical user community, to help maintain the high, a high level of quality with those documents. Um, opening up the docs to, to you, our external contributors, is how we scale. Okay, so what is DevRel? So the SQL Docs team is one of many docs teams for different products in Microsoft's cloud and AI DevRel. Um, DevRel is, is, develop, is short for developer relations and is the team that performs activities that connect developers and in-house um, goods and services with external users. So um, DevRel ensures that, products, that, that through our products, we establish a good continuous relationship with, with external developers um, through mutual communication. Del, DevRel... Um, definitely involves documentation. That's the part that we're most involved with, but it also includes reference documentation for how to call APIs and how to do, um, and includes code samples. DevRel in other companies might look like also um, community management, issue reporting and triage, release notes, focus groups, um, and public interaction. Your favorite video game, for example, probably has DevRel folks to send and receive communications with the public about bug reports, troubleshooting, patch notes, um, discussion, modifications, et cetera. Um, DevRel folks are technical and know the product well. Um, in fact, some tech companies cycle developers in and out of DevRel positions, so DevRel folks have a keen awareness of technical detail. This is also so that developers can see how end users consume products and communications. Um, at Microsoft, DevRel teams usually have a strong technical background from consulting or support positions as 
as William and I do. Most also have experience with project management, technical writing, blogging, or book writing. Um, and finally, DevRel is a strategic advantage for product teams because this type of outreach enhances adoption um, and provides authentic community engagement that goes beyond marketing and social media. Microsoft feels its DevRel is a strategic advantage over competitors. In a way, um, really DevRel is not marketing to CIOs and CEOs, it's marketing to developers and technical folks like you. There are products out there um, we've all used and we continue to use because we've had um, good experiences with the documentation or with support or because it's easy to adopt and there's a smooth learning curve. Um, so, and, and I know for myself, SQL was easy because the community is, is so fantastic. So um, in that spirit of authentic community involvement, uh, let's dig into this a little bit. William? Great. Thanks. So let's go over some Microsoft Docs, some features of the website, how you use them real quick, uh, some things especially new that you might not be aware of. So we're going to do a quick tour of navigating a specific doc. Uh, I'm not going to explain every button or anything like that, don't worry. So there's a save button now. This allows you to save links to collections to organize articles into groups that you might be using for a specific project or for studying for a certification exam, something like that. You can now save docs to a collection alongside Microsoft Learn modules and Q&A pages as well to gather all those materials into one place. That could also be really handy for you if you don't have access to the same computer every day and you're logging in because those are saved to your account. So in that way, they're more portable than bookmarks. So you're going to see two search boxes. The first at the top right hand corner searches the entire technology stack that you're in. For example, all of SQL or all of Azure. Then on the left hand side, the table of contents has uh, many different articles and it's here that you can search titles inside a given table of contents. And sometimes that just makes it easier to find the article you're looking for. On the right, you'll see a navigation for the article itself. And those header links that you see are linkable directly. So if you want to send someone a link to a heading specifically within the article, you'll notice it appends a little pound and then the name of the heading up in the URL. So those are deep links inside the document. You can also get access to that link by hovering over any heading. You'll see that little link icon up here and you can click that to get access to that URL. Okay, let's talk about versioning. Where it makes sense, the same document, the same article might include different information for different versions of the product that we've mentioned. And here on the bottom left-hand corner is just kind of a snippet of the markdown code that allows a document to show different information for different versions that you've requested. So we may use the same article for various versions of content for Windows versus Linux, or for different releases of SQL Server, or different Azure implementations of SQL Server. This on the, that, that code snippet, it just, um, we'll, we'll talk more about the markdown later. So if a doc doesn't look quite right because of a version specific detail, take a look at the version that you've requested in the top left-hand corner. That version dropdown list may come in handy. And that version dropdown list also affects the table of contents by including or excluding certain articles based on the version of SQL that you've requested. Sometimes we'll handle versioning via tabs inside of a document, or we'll clearly state the versions in the applies to row across the top of the article, or we'll use colorful note boxes throughout the article to make sure that you know what platform or version of SQL Server this content is applicable for. Also note that for content that is specific to older versions of SQL Server before SQL 2016, we do still have ways to access that content, even if some of those ways are offline only. And while we support content for all supported versions of SQL Server, just a friendly reminder that next summer, SQL 2012 extended support ends uh, in July of 2022. So if you don't already have a migration plan for those SQL 2012 boxes in place, it's time to start thinking about that. 
So speaking of management studio, not a lot of people are still aware of this, but when you have text highlighted and you hit F1 in management studio, uh, data tools, or really any visual studio, the browser should bring you to the corresponding article for that word or phrase of syntax that you've highlighted. So for example, here is just exec sessions. So this assumes that your workstation has access to the internet and you have selected the help preference open in browser, otherwise it'd bring you to an offline doc. Uh, and, but this will bring you to the Microsoft Docs online article in your browser. If you hit F1 on something that you've highlighted and it doesn't bring you to the specific article you'd expect or to a different article, that actually might be a Docs issue. And there's something that you could file an issue for and we'll talk about how to do that soon. If your work environment is behind an air-gapped network, or if you work in a high security environment like a nuclear power plant, you can download version specific docs through Management Studio. So this is a slide we take out when we're not talking to DBAs, but we're, we're at home here, Julie and I talking to DBAs, so we'll mention this. So in fact, like we said earlier, some of the older content for like SQL 2014 specifically, it's only available online uh, to get through Management Studio. So how many of you, uh, and let's do this by, by raising hands, I suppose, how many of you actually work with offline help for SQL or you have to work in an air-gapped network when you're a DBA? Gosh, I hope I hope that's a, a small number. It's uh, it's it's a, a number of one because that would be me. I don't see oh, any really? other hands raised, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, our, so our documentation uh, is a strategic advantage against competitors. There are some very large organizations out there including public sector stuff like the US Department of Defense and private sector companies at the top of the fortune list that want their development environments internal and secured away from the public internet. So in the case of Microsoft's documentation for SQL Server and for Power BI and for Azure and all sorts of other products, our documentation is hosted in GitHub and therefore can easily be cloned, periodically uh, pulled and re-hosted internally to those environments so that the customers get the best of both worlds, a secure network for development and access to fresh product documentation. Some of our competitors uh, want to deliver a few thousand PDFs or like some screen scraped images together as their documentation. Well, I mean, come on. So are there any questions about uh, the docs.com site? Anything like that at this point? You can come off and mute. All right, well, we haven't even gotten to the interesting stuff yet. so. Let's, let's do that. So how do you provide feedback? How do you contribute? So there's three main ways to do that that we're gonna talk about. The first is feedback.azure.com for product ideas and, and bug reports. And then for doc issues, so you know stuff that Julie and I would receive, you can use either GitHub issues or GitHub pull requests. And these operate just the same way as if you were contributing to any other open source project on GitHub. So how many of you in the audience have worked in Git, you're familiar with terminology like fork, clone, push, pull, commit? You can show by raise of hands there. Okay. With two hands raised, yeah. Yeah. Three. Three, yeah, right. Four, four, in, four including me. All right. And some hands are coming up and down, that's fine. All right, yeah, so most, most people, I think. That's okay, by the way, if you're not contributing can be done easily through the browser without having to learn Git, without having to learn Git Bash or install anything, without having to know what a fork, a clone, a push, or a pull is. We'll have an explainer later on how that process works. If you're unfamiliar, we're gonna walk you through screen by screen. It's very easy. If you are already familiar with Git or GitHub, and you're familiar with pull requests, remote repositories, things like that, and you can do all that, then yeah, you can contribute that way. And later we'll talk about how that process works behind the scenes that might be interesting to you as well. But again, in the case of SQL docs, we're all DBAs here. Not a lot of DBAs are familiar with Git. They don't work in that every day, and that's okay. That's not a problem. Anyone can help using the browser only. So we even have a step-by-step -step tutorial here at this URL to guide you through the process of creating a PR. We're gonna do that today, obviously too, but this is good reference for you. 
Then by contributing to Microsoft Docs for any product technology, you can be a part of the community and help edit docs that everyone uses. We're going to talk about a contributor designation at the top of an article where we average around 16 million page views a month. And again, you could do this entirely within the browser with nothing to install. So you're about to get an inside peek at the process behind Microsoft's Docs as Code approach. Content teams like ours, like the one Julie and I are on, are across all technologies, and we integrate with the product teams, we join their support reviews, we join their team meetings, we coordinate on their release schedules. So we really are part of the whole code approach. Let's get a walk through that now. So what's a bug? To be clear, support issues don't belong in document feedback. Uh, similarly, the product feedback channel uh, that we're gonna talk about is not for support issues. The feedback options we're about to discuss are not Microsoft support. We have no SLA for response time. If you're having a problem or an unexpected behavior or an outage, contact Microsoft support or your support partner. We triage incoming issues and pull requests in GitHub. And if it sounds like a support issue, like you, you have something urgent going on, your issue is probably gonna be closed up with a polite message to go contact support and some links. Most doc issues that get attention are a request to fix something that's missing or outdated or wrong, or a request to add something that would have helped prevent an error, prevent an outage. So if you've got feedback, you have three main options. First, you have the product feedback or suggestions, reproducible bug reports. Well, that actually doesn't belong in the doc system. That's for support, or you can use the feedback tool at feedback.azure.com. If you've been around for a few years, you might remember the connect system with connect items. So a few years ago, those were all migrated into this feedback.azure.com portal. And that's the place for your comments and suggestions for products. That's actually external to us on a docs content team, but that's where a lot of really good usability ideas and bug reports come from, and it's open to the public. So to get feedback on any product, you can use the gray box that you find on most documents, hit this product, and that will take you to the feedback.azure.com site for that product. So there you can look at other comments and suggestions, vote on them, and put your own in for many different Microsoft products. You might see a lot of these also shared around social media for when someone has a really good suggestion and wants to get the product team's attention with a lot of votes in favor. And you can see here, there's one with a lot of votes for a dark theme for SQL Server Management Studio. Really hoping we get that one day. Uh, so let's say you've got a documentation issue to suggest. Uh, and you can use the get issues. Think of this as just letting us know something wrong is here. You go fix it. We have goals to address these in a timely manner, but we'll be honest, issues are triaged and they might take days or weeks to get a satisfactory resolution. Not all issues will become a documentation change. Uh, so to create an issue, use that same gray box at the bottom of the article and hit the this page button you see. That'll bring you to the new issue screen. Throw your comments in here, give it a title, hit submit new issue, and we'll take it from there. It's that easy. And if you weren't aware, GitHub has a dark mode as well. It's actually very nice. I use it all the time. So how many of you, by show of hands, tries to work in dark themed apps, websites, things like that as much as possible? Yeah. Dark themed One rooms, person. perhaps, even? <laughs> One person, which speaks volumes about how much we don't like dark themes. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've, no, we've got a few folks who are responding <laughs> positively. <laughs> there you go. Well, I like I like working in dark theme stuff as much as possible. So when you go, log into GitHub.com, you'll see this in your profile page. I think it's under settings and appearance as well. And um, if you're an enthusiast for dark mode websites, docs.microsoft.com is a dark theme too. I promise I'm going to stop talking about dark theme websites soon. You can check out the footer of any docs article to change your theme from light to dark. Uh, also, dark mode is coming soon to Microsoft Word and LinkedIn. So that's going to be cool. All right. Back to contributing. Third option, you've got a documentation issue and you want to suggest the edits yourself 
or just you know get it started. You don't have to have a complete solution. You can click on the edit button in the top right hand corner of an article. That will bring you to the GitHub preview page for the article, where now you're actually looking at the markdown. We'll talk about that later. From here, click the red pencil button, or the, the pencil button that I've got boxed in red here in the top right-hand bar. Now, there you go. Now you're looking at the actual markdown, not the preview of the markdown, but the actual markdown code. It might surprise you to learn that Microsoft Docs are not edited in Microsoft Word but rather in code, in Markdown, and then some are in YAML. We'll talk about that. Uh, Markdown is a lightweight text markup language created for formatting rich text with a plain text editor. GitHub has their own formal implementation of Markdown called GitHub Flavored Markdown. And if you're thinking to yourself, well, I don't know Markdown, many different online sites use Markdown for their content. Not just GitHub, but GitLab, Reddit, Stack Exchange, Bitbucket, Drupal, and a lot more. So you actually might already be more familiar with Markdown than you think. You can make your changes in here. If you're not familiar with Markdown, again, it's pretty easy to understand once you get rolling. Uh, don't worry about the style being perfect. The content team is always gonna review your content submission and tweak it to Microsoft standards before it's merged live. There are plenty of resources online for the basics of Markdown syntax. But if you don't get something quite right, if you don't know how to make a link, don't sweat it. We'll do that. You can always preview the changes then with that uh, box that I have marked in red there to preview the markdown formatting. It's not going to look exactly like it would look on the docs.microsoft.com site, but it'll look pretty close. Then once you're done, scroll to the bottom. Here you have a chance to commit your changes. Enter your pull requests title and some comments. Give it a description and hey, maybe even throw in the hashtag ping MSFT docs. Just think of that as a way to wave hi to us. Uh, we'll talk more about that later, but you can also use that same hashtag on Twitter to say hi and potentially draw attention to your pull request on Twitter. That's another way that we can recognize you for your contribution. So then you're going to choose the create a new branch for this commit and start a pull request radio button there. Yeah, the other one actually is not enabled because we don't allow you to commit code to our, our main repository, of course. Uh, you'll notice that it gives the new branch a simple name, just your username, dash patch, and then dash an ordinal number. That's fine. You don't have to worry about changing that. If you're not familiar with GitHub terminology like branches and pull requests, again, don't worry. You don't have to be. Once you submit your pull request by hitting the green commit changes button, we'll take it from there will keep you updated as your pull request moves through the process. Your changes to the markdown file will be proposed for merge, triaged, and reviewed by the article's author and its reviewers. The content team for the article will take it from there. We'll reply to the pull request in its comments. We'll make more edits if necessary, and we'll eventually merge the code in. You'll be notified along the way with feedback directly from one of us on the content team, maybe even me or Julie. Again, you can do all of this if you want through your own tooling. You can create your own fork, your own branch, your own commits, your own push, and then pull request. That's what we on the content team do every day. If you just want to use github.com, use the website to handle the entire process for you. It's actually much easier. Here's what a pull request looks like after you've submitted it. Your pull request is actually going to start in an open status. You see here that, well, I'm going to use the laser point, this new thing. We can Look at that. You can see here, this one is already uh, merged, which means it's been accepted and it's pushed to a preview repo, where soon it will be merged to the live production repo. You can see what GitHub did here for you was to automatically in the background create a fork here, uh, here in the branches in Hiroshi's name. And then after the pull request includes the commit, you see with the red arrow there, that's the actual commit in the pull request log. Uh, pull requests can include many different commits for many different files. So if you have two files you want to update in a similar way, you can actually do both of those in the same pull request. At the bottom, that pull request log is going to contain all the messages, both the automated and the manually created messages, and you can contribute to that conversation just by leaving a comment there. You'll receive an email anytime 
anyone uses your username with the at symbol, you'll receive an email from GitHub. And you can respond in the conversation as well here. Sometimes we'll ask more questions or um, you know, ask for, ask for screenshots or something like that. Once your pull request is created, both you and Microsoft can review the changes that have been made. So click on the Files Changed tab to see an in-browser differential. Red is the old code, green is the new, and changed characters are highlighted. And you can see here someone, uh, Hiroshi, suggested a real simple typo fix. Uh, in fact, you may find creating a GitHub pull request easier than creating an issue. Sometimes if you're trying to describe how something should change, trying to describe it is, uh, is going to take a lot more work than just doing the change yourself. For example, moving these two asterisks around to make sure that the right thing is bolded. If you're trying to describe how something should change, um, sometimes this is much easier to just go ahead and do it. And that's why we like to see pull requests. If you still wanted to make more changes, even after you've created the pull request, you can hit the three dots button right there, click edit file, and then you're back at the markdown edit screen and you can make another typo fix in the same article in the same pull request. After you've submitted your pull request, you can sit back. We've got it from here. We'll let you know if you have any more questions or if we have a status update for you. So those are your three options. Now, what's most helpful to Microsoft and what gives you contribution credit? Only the third option, only a pull request. That's actually what we want to see. After your pull request is in, say hi to us on Twitter using the hashtag ping MSFT docs so we can recognize you as a contributor there as well. And if you've contributed via a pull request and we merge your commit into the document, you'll get your GitHub picture and a link to your GitHub profile at the top of that document. The folks listed here are both those inside Microsoft and external to Microsoft that submitted commits to an article. But you only get your name and your logo on an article for a pull request, not for an issue. And these contributions can be a part of your MVP application or your renewal activity. We're actually not involved in the MVP process, but um, like, like anything in the ad MVP process, it's uh, much more about quality than quantity. This can be a way for you uh, to contribute, though, and get recognition for that. Okay, if you're not sure how it should change, just give it a shot. If it's not quite right, if it's not formatted perfectly, don't worry, we'll adjust it, but at least it gets fixed. At least you've drawn attention to it. For images, graphics, charts, et cetera, we have designers to get images updated in a standardized way, so there's no need to open up Photoshop and start editing images yourself, unless you think that would be very helpful or explanatory. Finally, capitalization. Uh, the capitalization of various features and products inside Microsoft is one of the more nuanced bits there is about publishing. Marketing usually wins these, marketing always wins these arguments, regardless of how a product's documentation <laughs> evolved throughout its development process. So uh, we just had a big poll request come in a few weeks ago to make a lot of capitalization changes that were mostly misguided. So again, that task is tricky enough when you have information directly from the inside sources. So we'll handle that part. Yes, if you spot inconsistencies between marketing content and documentation content and training content, you should know we're regularly discussing and working on that stuff internally uh, and don't be afraid to point something out. For example, the product names and feature names and phrasing are difficult to get just right and are trickiest when a generic word is part of the product name. So just because we have a product called the Azure SQL database, for example, doesn't mean that every word database is now capitalized. This is even more difficult for our international partners and customers because capitalization often means that a product or service name shouldn't be translated or should be translated in a very specific way but a lowercase common noun of the same term should be translated. Inconsistency and in capitalization confuses translators and customers. So that consistency is important. So are the coal and, and, and so are the core goals of our brand's voice, which is above all to be simple and human. And if we can do better to meet that goal, please let us know.
All right, one last bit about contributions for localization issues, such as a translation issue. If you've got a translation issue to raise, those are actually submitted by email now. The process changed within the last year, actually. So you download an Outlook email template. You can submit your feedback in any language. It will be automatically translated and then routed to the local, uh, the correct localization team. If you've got a technical issue with an article and you're most comfortable submitting your issue in another language than English, no problem. Instead of creating an issue or a pull request in English, you can use that email template. It will be translated and then passed on to the proper content teams, like perhaps our SQL content team. Either way, thanks for contributing and making Microsoft Docs better for everyone, everywhere. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Julie. Okay, so now that you've seen how you can use GitHub to contribute to Docs, we're gonna briefly show you behind the scenes and talk about how we use GitHub to host Microsoft documentation. So Docs behind the scene. Again, Microsoft Docs are edited in Markdown or YAML. Um, William's already talked about Markdown. YAML, uh, we use for our table of contents and our FAQ articles where that format is better suited to, for SEO. YAML is also, um, like Markdown, a plain text markup language used for structuring or serializing data. Okay, we spend most of our time using Visual Studio Code or Azure Data Studio to edit our documents. We have other tools to help with automated um, link checking, uh, syntax formatting, bulk updates, and a series of include files to tokenize things like product names. We have a, a rich set of metadata for each article. We do pay attention to how articles perform in terms of, terms of search engine optimization and traffic patterns and trends. These are all driven through, this is all driven through Azure Analytics and Kustos queries. We try, um, we try to keep performing, uh, I'm sorry, we try to keep improving our poorly performing articles. We use metrics to track the performance of articles, including for, for example, if you copy text from the article, that's good, we, we can track that. We, um, if you click through, scroll, or dwell on a page, we can track that. And these are the same kinds of metrics that any website uses um, to measure how effective the web page is. Uh, we do this without capturing any personal information or any wider tracking information. For big article updates, we have um, we have a system to handle release branches. Uh, this system allows us to work on documentations for possibly months at a time and then to release a new product all at once, like during um, you know, our conferences, like for a, during the um, Ignite keynote. Okay, so some behind the scenes of how Microsoft Docs works in Git, um, specifically GitHub, where all of our Microsoft documentation is managed. If you're new to Git and don't understand this, don't worry, we'll, try, we'll explain. Um, but all of this is actually managed for you. So this is kind of just a look at the back end. So this is the basic GitHub workflow. Okay, so the first thing we have is um, repositories. So a repository um, like Azure Docs is where the source documentation is housed and where the website engine pulls Markdown to present live pictures to you in websites. Okay, then we have a fork, and a fork is a copy of the repo associated with your GitHub account. In each fork we've, um, so each individual creates their own forks of the repo in your GitHub account. To tell the two apart, the, to tell the repository from the fork, we have two different names. Um, a common convention is to reference your remote fork as origin, and the code base you eventually push to, um, which is Microsoft Docs, would be called upstream. So these are called remote names or remotes. And this is just the common naming conventions that, that we use. You can choose any name for your remotes. Um, you'll have an origin and an upstream for each repo that you work in. Okay, next we have a clone. So a clone is just a copy of the for of your fork, for, you know, the fork that you made from 
from the upstream repo. It's a copy of that that you bring locally to your workstation so you can make edits. When you go to make changes to a file or to add or remove files, you'll create a working branch. Um, this working branch will contain the changes you'll be making. You want a branch to contain only the changes for a specific feature or issue you're addressing so that it can be treated as a block of changes to send back up the stream. Okay, your work goes into a branch. In, in this case, the branch is called fix issue. And we've appended the ISO date to the front of it. Um, when you're done creating your branch and doing your fixes, the first thing you do is commit the branch locally to your own clone on your workstation. Okay, then, then you're going to push the commit from your origin in GitHub doc to your origin in GitHub.com. So remember, this is the fork of your code in your GitHub account. So it still hasn't gone to anything Microsoft Docs. It's just still in your your local your copies. Once you do that, then you're going to issue a pull request, and then the pull request is going to ask. Um, sorry, you push from local to origin. Then you're going to do your pull request, which is going to be asking the Microsoft Docs repository to accept your the changes from your repository, so that your changes can be merged from your fork into the main repo. To explain things a little closer to the reality of how we work internally, we actually have two repositories in the Microsoft Docs account. The Azure Docs repository drives the website, but like true professionals, we don't develop against production. We only develop in the preview repository, which is not visible to the public and allows us to work in and preview the merged state of our changes in the actual live repository. This build process to the live website occurs usually twice a day and is gated by a team of build reviewers. So when you submit pull requests, you don't have to worry about that. Your workflow and all the validation necessary occurs inside the public Azure Docs repo. And again, the same Docs as code pattern applies to any Microsoft technology repo in Microsoft Docs. Any questions about how this works? I just wanted to confirm that if you're doing this all in browser, there's no need to do the clone to your local workstation and then do that commit and push back and everything. So I just wanted to uh, emphasize that for. Absolutely. Yeah. It even yeah. makes the fork for you uh, if you don't already have it made the first yeah. time you go to open up a pull request. But that, at that point, yeah, you can you can skip the whole clone process. Uh, so it's it's if if you want to make extensive changes to the stuff, then sure have a copy on your local workstation, but you don't need it if you're just doing a, a quick typo or small contribution. Yep. And that's fantastic right. because and most be contributions, yeah, yeah. Again, and most DBAs don't know this stuff, and so we don't want to you know make them learn Git just to put in a a request. Most of the pull requests that we get are simple, either questions or text edits or or both. And so it's easy to do in the browser. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? I don't see any raised hands. OK. So um, again, you can do this all through github.com in the browser. But if you're interested in learning more about Git and GitHub, there are some great resources from Microsoft Learn. So they have learning paths for to foundational GitHub knowledge. There's introduction to version control with Git, and then there's also use Git version control tools in Visual Studio Code. Okay, so next we're going to cover what's new in Docs. Actually, I think we do. Carrie have has a, a hand up. Yeah. Oh, we've yeah. got a hand, Carrie. Yes, that is me. Um, hey, I'm just curious now. Um, seems to me, didn't my who bought GitHub? Was that did Microsoft buy GitHub? We did. <laughs> okay, but um, so when I've been us using Azure DevOps because it's got a direct pipeline to to the cloud, um, are you is 
is Azure Dev, DevOps going to be abandoned or should, is it like a supplemental thing or or how? I can answer that question. Great. Go ahead. Uh, they, they um, so as not to put the Microsoft folks in the spot, um, they are they are solving two different types of problem. GitHub is more oriented towards open source activities, whereas Azure DevOps is more of a, um, if you remember the old on-premises version control systems like TFS, that's kind of where the Azure DevOps side sits right now. And it's not going anywhere. There will be a lot of work done on, on GitHub to support more Microsoft um, streams, but they're, they're both going to be supported independently. There, there's going to be some features that that will be available in one that won't be available in the other, but it's not going to be abandoned. And that should answer your question. Absolutely, it does. Thanks. <laughs> and, and I think the source control solution inside DevOps is GitHub. It's just uh, it's um, yeah. Well, it's it's Git. It's not GitHub. They ah. there you can still you can still do TFS which is the old on-premises right. source control thing that was the much better version of uh, Visual Source Safe. But uh, most, well, <laughs> all, new, all new repositories are hosted with Git, which is the source control system that also powers GitHub. So you can transfer stuff between them if you want to. And GitHub Pipelines borrows a lot of concepts from Azure DevOps. So it was a good question. Mm. Thank you, cool. Carrie. Awesome. Great. Anything else? I don't see so, any other hands. Okay. So something new that we something else new that we've added in February of just this year, we introduced dynamic recommended content in the footer of many Microsoft Docs articles. So the links in the content are determined by a machine learning solution and based on a model that describes customer behaviors within our documentation set. We've seen really positive metrics on tracking traffic to recommended files so far. So we think this is helping people find what they need. Also new to docs, you can add certifications to your docs.microsoft.com login by permanently, note permanently, connecting your certification profile from Microsoft Learn. Go to your, you go to your profile in Learn or docs to connect your certifications. Go to certifications and click on connect certification profile. You can get notifications for certification renewals and more and link directly to Pearson View to schedule the exams you're pursuing. Okay, the next conference coming up for Microsoft is Inspire 2021. This is happening online July 14th and 15th and registration is now open if you're interested in that conference. Okay, and that's concludes our presentation if so we're at the question and answer section if so the floor is now open for any questions thank you i would encourage oh mala mala just came off mute so mala has a question so hi william and julie um, i really enjoyed the talk um, i have some questions for you um, the shop where i work we are a heavily on-prem environment um, we use a lot of uh, obscure features that are documented, uh, not documented sometimes too, like uh, script DOM, the T SQL parser, some aspects of SMO and stuff like that. Um, but what we can provide to you is only stuff that's been tested in our environment, like on-prem environment. Uh, would that be something of concern um, to publish or would it be accepted? I was just wondering. So you're talking about like uh, sample scripts and things like that. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't. We don't have. We have a sample scripts uh, repository that the product team manages. Um, and then I think uh, like CSS has their own sample scripts, like the the Tiger team does. But they usually generate all that content internally exclusively. I s might still be working. No, not uh, just, sorry, I, I want to correct myself. Not just sample scripts, but anything that I can offer to you has only been tested in our world. Like you may have situations where it might work differently, like for example, an as a SQL DB and things like that. But I, I personally, I have no way of verifying that at work. So, 
so Mala, are you asking? So like if you're if something's not working the way that you think it is the way it's documented, are you saying like if you put in a PR, you can't mm -hmm. verify that it works in all the other systems? Is Correct. That yes, the second so one, yes. I would go ahead and still submit it if you think that we haven't documented how it works. And what we do is we look at that and then we'll test it. Okay. And we will That's test what it I across wanted to know. the different yeah. systems. And if it if it okay. just works that way, um, mm -hmm. you know, on prem, then we will document that and we will document how it works for other things. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mala, that what was other? a good question because because you've reminded me, sorry, sorry for interrupting, William. Mm -hmm. You've reminded me of a of a situation where um, I found a a bug in the documentation for date time two, which is a data type that was uh, released in SQL Server 2008. And uh, with the help of another MVP, we discovered that the documentation wasn't correct in some cases, but I didn't have all the information myself either. So mm -hmm. when, when, when Paul and I spoke about it together, we realized that we were both correct and that uh, we, were, we were learning from each other, as it, as it turns out. So um, mm -hmm. when, I sub when I submitted the PR, I included information from Paul that helped whoever was in charge of updating the article to have enough information to verify it on their side and then and then update the documentation accordingly. So it's, it's, it's a good question. I think anything that you can add that will improve the knowledge of everybody reading it that can be verified from their side is, is going to be valuable. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, even, Thank if, you. even if it's uh, this is different on one SQL platform, because you know we got we have so many. We have Synapse, we have the old PDW, yeah. we've got yeah. MI, SQL DB, we've got the SQL Server on VM, SQL Server on Prem. Um, yeah, any kind of information. Even it doesn't have to be a complete solution. It doesn't have to be completely formatted correctly, even. Uh, mm -hmm. to be a good PR, to actually produce a good doc change. You know, the other thing that I thought you might have been asking about, which is worth mentioning, is that we've gotten, well, in my short time anyway, a couple requests to document undocumented stored procedures. And that is tricky because the stored procedure is there, like the system stored procedure is there. Um, but the response has had to have been because from an engineering standpoint, and from a technical support agreement standpoint, it's there, but it's not supported. And so it remains undocumented. Um, it's not the other way around. It's not undocumented, and so it's not supported. It's because it's not fully supported. It's maybe only partially implemented. It hasn't been um, uh, developed and refined uh, with graceful error handling. I think in the last case that we were just talking about, um, that it's going to remain undocumented just because from a support agreement they don't um, they don't extend that that high level of support you can still use it we don't recommend to use it in production but when it comes to some of the undocumented stuff like you were mentioning uh, it's it's worth asking um, but the last couple times i've asked if we could go ahead and fully support and therefore document a system stored procedure it has not gotten a lot of traction mm -hmm. That's, but uh, you know, that's that's worth asking about, though. It's still worth putting in a pull request for, even if the pull request is, "Hey, could you document this?" <laughs> or or the issue, right? Yeah. Good question, though. Any others? I don't see any other hands, and everybody's on mute. Sorry. Right. <laughs> Maybe let you get out of here early tonight. Well, cool. I think they're all right on time. All yeah. Right. Well, thanks, everybody. Hopefully, we can do this in yeah. person one day. That'd be awesome. Again, good job keeping yeah. your local user community alive and keeping this technical community in Calgary going. This is great attendance, even for an in-person talk, much less a virtual one. So great job.